Susan Inglis, who is the director of, did I just demote you? The executive director, I, I apologize. I should have just said CEO and it would have been all better, of the Sustainable Furnishings Council. To my right, do these two people need any introduction? No, I have a feeling not, but I simply must. Angelo Sermelis, um, the amazing designer and prolific television personality in design on HGTV and other channels, and the also creator of Angelo Home. To my right, the most lovely Kathy Ireland, uh, who has had an amazing career, um, in my opinion, always about design, and now sharing it with the world in her expression of her authenticity through her collection and her dedication to sustainability. So with that, I'm going to start the discussion um, by asking you, Susan, to just give us that really important, succinct soundbite of why there is a Sustainable Furnishings Council here. Yes. The Sustainable Furnishings Council exists to raise awareness and promote best practices for sustainability throughout the home furnishings industry. So the first thing we did was establish those best practices, set standards for uh, recognizing what are best practices. And then we set out to spread the word that these things exist and to facilitate more and more of these practices being implemented. And for that awareness raising part, all of y'all are key partners. You, for having loaned us your names and reputations to draw attention, and you for giving us a, a page and a venue for um, putting this information out. Yeah. And so, I would love to know, when the two of you first met Susan and Sustainable Furnishings Council, um, you, you get asked all the time to endorse products, to be um, aligned with products and their messages. What was so important to you about their mission and why you dedicate yourself and really in a very critical way, not just landing a name, but really developing based on these principles. So I'd love to hear that. Maybe Kathy, we start with you. Thank you. Great question. Um, I know for both Angelo and myself, it's such an honor to be here. and. Rather than lending our names, we give our hearts to this because it's so important to what we do. Um, and I'm a little bit sensitive. I, I know I'm overly sensitive. My career back in the last century, my job description was shut up and pose. And when, um, it, you know, I promise, but that's what it was. <laughs> and when we started our brand, I knew it had to be very different. Um, I get accused of being a control freak, and that's okay. Part of the reason of that is the sustainability and why that's important to me. Um, back when I modeled, I tried and failed at many businesses before starting our brand with a pair of socks. The socks were made out of soda pop bottles. This was in 1993, before green was on, on people's minds so much. Um, and people laughed. They thought not only with the socks a stupid idea, but soda pop bottles, that is just not chic at all. <laughs> um, not only does it work, it saves a lot of money. And when we're talking about sustainability, we've got to sustain our companies, our teams, so that we can keep these jobs in place. It's very broad reaching. So when I learned about you and what you're doing, it's so in line with how we built our company. And grassroots level from the ground up. It's all about people. It's about researching who you're with. Um, I have one example, our partners at KI Home by Omnia Furniture. Great partners, um, all made in as many of our manufacturers are right here in the United States. But they adhere to the highest levels of sustainability. Do we have more work to do? Absolutely. There's always more to do. We can always be better. But to work with people who get it and we're on page. We had an incident 
a few years ago where we walked away from a very lucrative <coughs> relationship because these partners, and I'm very loyal, when I get into a relationship with someone, it's long term, and so I, I don't take that lightly. But this was just not okay because they were not adhering to the California standards, which are the highest, and they said, no, we can sell this product in other states, it'll be okay. And I said, what, are you kidding me? Forget it. Um, and and we're, we're so good with that decision. Our banks, our financial advisors are having heart attacks over it still, but no deal, they'll get over it. It's about people and who you work with. So when we met you and learned a, about what this was all about and our, our partners from Omnia, our founding members of this, uh, just, I, I applaud you and I thank you for doing it. And Angela, so, you know, I love your story of, of the heritage of how you even got into design and that just really tickled me and I know it was important to the audience in Las Vegas so you simply must share part of the vignette because it's so much aligned to where you are today. I will. Uh, first I have to say that it was a no-brainer when I met Susan at the San Francisco's council by Kathy. We met, the message was clear instantly and I was like, I'm on board, what do you want from me and how can I help you do what you do? And my story for design is one that is a little off the mark because I never sought out to be a designer. Um, we were just talking right before we got on stage. I was the kid that if you talked to him, I would turn into a puddle on the floor. I was so embarrassed just to be alive, let alone interact with people. So I, I think that the idea that I could go off and not only design, but do it on television was something that my parents thought, there's no way in the world these kids can do that. And we were really a very blue collar family. We moved to Chicago from Greece when I was about six. My dad was a shorter cook, my mom was a waitress. These were not people that, that ran in these circles. Even though they had amazing, amazing style and taste, they, they had no money. And so I, for some reason, was always into the way our space looked, even though we lived in a very modest, you know, a one-room apartment. I remember leaning up against the walls of our Chicago apartment thinking at six years old, if I leaned hard enough, I could move the walls and change the space. <laughs> Well, I realized I couldn't do that, so I started dragging the furniture instead. Like, I'd wake up at 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning when my parents were asleep, and I would physically drag the furniture so they'd wake up to something happening in the other room. And finally, they got the idea that I wasn't going to kill myself in the morning. I connected the dots and thought, oh, there's a job here. Because I just assumed that everybody designs their own home, right? We all design our own homes. And so I went off trying to do other stuff for a career. But I would always go back to design and do it with friends and friends of friends and family of friends. And everyone would say, we just stop messing around and be a designer. I didn't know what that meant. And when I finally took that leap, a leap of faith really to do that, um, it was it was a very unorthodox way of looking at design for me because I hadn't gone through all the channels of design. I was an art major in school, you know, I, I, I I was a fine artist and I did sculpture and I didn't really have all the, the regular tools of design. So when I approached the room, I approached it in a very different way and I found out that people were actually responding to that. They were, they, they were actually calling me and saying, hey, I just had my house designed by a designer and I don't know who lives here anymore. Can you come and help me? And so I would go in and sort of do the opposite of what the designer did and it, it turns out that I was working. And one thing led to another, I wanted to doing it on TV, which is a, it's a whole other story that I'm not getting into. It was bizarre. And I kept doing it on TV because I really loved, I, it's, it's, it's this dorky saying that the producers of our shows would always say, in the reveal, you know how the homeowners always cry during the reveal. And they'd always say, if the homeowner's not crying, just stick the camera on Angelo, because he's bawling like a baby. Because I was, I'd be in the corner and just bawling my eyes out during the reveal because I saw the impact that our shared union of creating a room had done for these homeowners. It changed the way they felt about their life and their space, and it was really emotional. And I kind of said no for a very long time to the idea of creating a product line. Because, you know, I didn't want more product out there for the sake of product. And then when I finally partnered with Happy Living, uh, who's in the audience right now, they got what it was that I was doing. They were the impetus to be able to help me get there because they were producing, they could produce what I wanted to design. And that's how the green sustainable functions thing came into, into play because as a designer, the first thing I thought of was how do we make this 
important in the world? How do we make it sustainable? And I went to the go-to things, the knee-jerk reaction things, you know, um, the dyes and the fabrics, organic cottons, sustainable woods. And my partner said, well, we are kind of sustainable by default because of the way that our stuff packs, the uh, carbon footprint, the way that it breaks down, the way that you have no polystyrene in the boxes, we use recycled coil, and all this other stuff. And I thought, wow, I didn't think about the carbon footprint. I was so busy thinking about soy-based inks and organic cottons. And when we hooked up, there was this whole other world of sustainability that opened up to me. And now it's become not only part of our daily conversation with all my partners, I feel like I am exactly where the consumer is. I'm learning every step of the way. The stuff that I feel that I know, but as far as sustainability is concerned, I feel like I'm sponge. I just want to learn more and more and more. How do we take that and not make it this place that is high up on a hill that we have to reach for, but make it something that feels like it's just it's right here in front of us. So the decision isn't an extra thing that you have to think about. Like, oh, now I have to go think about sustainable design. It's just part of the conversation, and you don't even know sometimes that you are being sustainable, and by default you are. So, you know, that you bring up a good point because I can't tell you how much mail we get, um, you know, thankfully there's the sustainability right. part of our business, um, about the, these questions. How do I know I'm buying something sustainable? What do I look for? How do I understand even the questions to ask? And what's so nice is that we can now say, please go to this website, look at the principles. Both of you have collections that are manufactured by companies who are certified by the Sustainable Furnishings Council. And um, it is so important, and I can tell you from you know, running a media brand, that the kind of information and education that is so necessary to make it accessible and not make it on top of the world, um, is what we need much more of. So Susan, what, what are those basic principles of certification? Because we really need to keep demystifying this entire notion so that everybody feels less daunted by the word, by the principles, and by how much fun it is and how interesting it is to actually be a student of it and an acquirer of it. So go through just those simply because yeah. everybody will be surprised that it is not this rigorous, you know, tome of information. Yeah. Um, first, I will clarify that the Sustainable Furnishings Council is not a certifying body, but is a membership organization. And all the member companies involved in the home furnishings industry in various ways have made a public and verifiable commitment to sustainability and a commitment to transparency and a commitment to continuous improvement. This sustainability that they are committed to is a matter, as we've been saying, of a triple bottom line. It's the way in which that particular company is taking care of being responsible to environmental conservation and to the communities that their ecosystems support and to the economies that support those communities. As you say, it has to be profitable all the way around. So some of the things to look for when you are looking for a sustainable product are questions like those found in the brochure on your chair. Questions like, where is this made? And what is it made of? We, uh, one of the things that you will find when you ask that about on the leather, where your furniture is made, is that it is made right here in Southern California. And you will find that the leather, something that we think can't possibly be sustainable, it, it, leather is a long-lasting product. So whatever the impact of producing a piece of leather, it is spread out over a long amount of time. The leather that is used in this particular line is the best possible way to tan leather. It is tanned in, under EU law and is frequently from cows that lived and died as well as having their hide tanned under EU law, which is the best law. So those, that is one sort of thing to look for is uh, what can you learn about the material? When you're asking those questions about the Angela home line, what, um, you will see examples of this furniture in the Sustainable Furnishings Council booth, which is 1122 just over here. You will see a lot of reclaimed materials and recycled materials. 
reclaiming and recycling saves energy as well as natural resources. So that is a, um, a, another basic principle, is to save energy as well as to save natural resources.